Our loving God in heaven, we again come to you this morning to worship you, to give you thanks and praise for your goodness towards us. We understand more and more how privileged we are to have this light when we recognize how much darkness the world is in. Help us to appropriate it, to love it, to let it sink in and to change us. We want to be the best influence that is possible for those that are nearest and dearest, but also for those that um, will still be affected by the ripples of our life. We ask that you would be with our worship this morning, with both presentations, with all our members worshipping across Oceania. We pray for our Fijian uh, members this morning uh, as they meet. And we just, um, just thank you for the technology that has been available to us to make this possible. We know that it is both a blessing and a curse, but may we be blessed this morning with your presence and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this morning we're going to review part of one of Elder Tessa's presentations. It's going to be part of one she did in 2021 at a French camp meeting in October. So it's the last presentation of that French camp meeting on the, October 30th and part of the beginning of the next camp meeting, which was for us, Oceania, which was November 27. So it's uh, part of both because she continued on with the study in November. Again, it's just portions of those studies. The first study is called Ted Wilson and the Nature of Babylon, and the second, Ted Wilson's Aberrations. First of all, though, I want to go back to a presentation I did in Fiji in October, and we'll just review that for a short time. What we did is we showed how we construct the line of agriculture from five key passages. And we built that line. And I've drawn the basic line up here. We understand that there is a time of fallowness or darkness when nothing is being done. A message comes, first angel's message, and it uh, creates the fear of God and we start plowing. Line upon line. Once the ploughing is completed, the seeds can be sown. Rain, early rain, is needed to germinate that seed, creates a blade, fruit, latter rain, brings that fruit to maturity. Ready for harvest. So when we take 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 and we place that on that line as well, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine arrives in the time of the end. That doctrine, first angel's message, is going to tell you that you're a sinner, you need to fear God because judgment is coming. It's going to reprove you. It's going to tell you you're a bad farmer. Look at all those thorns and thistles. You are not prepared for harvest. So it wakes you up and puts you to work. We call that reproof. Then begins a correction. A correction is a writing of a wrong. It's more than reproof. I'll just put a C for correction. It's going from one direction to the other. So it's a, a writing of a wrong, correction. Then instruction in righteousness, which we mark from 9-11 to close of probation. We're being instructed in righteousness. That instruction is coming through the messages, through the early rain, through the latter rain that the man of God may be perfect. The definition of perfect is thoroughly furnished unto all good works. There's our good works there. 
It's the fruit that's come to maturity. We're thoroughly furnished in that fruit and when we're ready for harvest. If we go to 1 John 1 verse 9, a familiar verse to us all, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So where do we mark confess? Right here, we'll confess our sins. Look what a bad farmer I've been. Look at all the thorns and thistles in my paddock. Look at the latest in darkness I've been in. Uh, I, I've, been, I've been neglectful. We confess. We confess Jesus is uh, faith, uh, faithful to forgive. We mark forgiveness here. We come to the foot of the cross. We're baptism, baptized. All our sins from there in the past have been washed away. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and then to do what? Cleanse from all unrighteousness. Which makes perfect sense. If we're being instructed in righteousness, then we must also be cleansed from all unrighteousness. When we, uh, we call this sanctification. We call this justification. What is sanctification? It's continual sanctification. What is it to be instructed and cleansed from, uh, instructed in righteousness and cleansed from unrighteousness? It's continual correction and forgiveness. Because all this does here is it forgives us from our past sins, our known sins. What happens when we get instructed in righteousness? From here on in, we're going to learn more about sin. Therefore, our, um, our confession and repentance and forgiveness will continue through this time period. It's continual justification. So what is the righteousness that we're being instructed in in this time period? Anybody want to say before I talk over somebody? <laughs> what is the righteousness that we're being instructed in? Is it equality? Yes. Thank you, Marie. Gender equality. What is the unrighteousness we're being cleansed from? We could say gender inequality, or we could say Patriarchy, headship. The same time we're being instructed, we're also being cleansed. This isn't just an intellectual experience. It is something that we are to put into practice. So our faith comes from the messages and then we, our fruit comes from the practice. So this is our period of instruction in righteousness, cleansing from unrighteousness. What happens in harvest? Because there's no rain in harvest. So we talked about that, that there is no rain in harvest. And yet God sometimes does send rain. And that rain comes as a judgment on the people. So we looked at the, this sickle, this harvesting process is also where we receive messages. Those messages have a particular purpose. They are not the rain messages. We've already received the rain. They are an increase of understanding of those rain messages. If you think about the harvest, what else do we call that? We call it the time of trouble. Think about the three worthies in the fiery furnace. They've passed their test, closed the probation, and yet they still have to go through the time of trouble. And what gets burned up 
in that fiery furnace. It's what's binding them. There's, there's things that are still trapping them, binding them. Daniel is still trapped in the lion's den here. The three worthies still have ties around them here. They have to go. There are things that are still tying us to this earth, still tying us to unrighteousness, and we need more information in order to burn them off, to cut them off. So when we come down to our lines, um, and we think about this, the presentation that we're going to be reviewing today, October 2021, Elder Tess makes a point in that last presentation of the French camp meeting to say that we need to be reviewing the messages from Apis Bull right through to the end of 2021 to, to Panium. We need to be reviewing those messages, uh, repeating them and reviewing them. Why? So from Apis Bull onwards. So let's have a look here. Uh, so this is the line of the 144,000. This is the line of the priests and the Levites. So just put the dates down. One of the Levites, 9-11. Whoop, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Unencumbered by the thought process. Sunday law. Okay, so where do we mark uh, these messages? Apis bull through to Panium. So right here, 2019, we've got an increase of knowledge. and a formalization. At the same time here, on the line of the priests, we have an increase of knowledge and a formalization. So we'll just go through with our topics for time. The increase of knowledge on the line of the 144,000 was what month in 2019? August, and it was feminism. The message to close the probation for the priests in 2019 was in November. Then in 2020, the message of Apis Bull, yeah. Leading to our formalization. Whoops. <laughs> I'm tired. Formalization, and that is uh, LGBT, which I'll write for short. So that is in, uh, I want to write August again, but I don't think that's. Um, Yeah, it is August. And then up here in October, we have the message of radical feminism. So the increase of knowledge on the line of 144,000 is feminism that will be formalized in the subject of rad radical feminism in uh, 2021. For the line of the priest, the increase of knowledge is Apis Bull, which will get formalized to LGBT also in 2021. I didn't write 2021 there, but that's the same, same year. So we can see that all of these messages have to do with gender equality. 
and they are in a time of harvest because when did the rain come? The rain is here and if we mark 2018, and I'll just only put 2018 as the midnight cry, the latter rain, what is the message that is given to us in 2018? Is it feminism? No, Trick question. Was, um, two streams. <laughs> yes, two streams. So what is it about two streams of information? Thank you. So 2018, two streams. And we're in 2018. And what two strings meant then was Republicans, Democrats. We've refined that a little now. We've sifted the Democrats or in the process of that. But back then in 2018, it was pretty simple, Republicans and Democrats. Or Clinton, Trump. Democrats, Republicans. If you accepted two streams of information, then you had to accept Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton's party was the Democrats. So you have to accept what happened in 2016. And if you accepted what happened in 2016 at that election, then you had to accept what happened in 2015. What happened in 2015? Bernie Sanders. Gay marriage. Gay marriage. Democrats. If you're going to accept Clinton, then you have to go along with what is attached to her. So 2016, it's not LGBTQ. It's woman. A, white, cisgender, heterosexual woman. That is the test, that is the two stream. But attached to her are subjects like gay marriage, LTBTQ. They are part of the same, same um, subject, but the, the clincher there really is Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. Women are the nation. <laughs> Yes, so we need to follow the thread. First comes Clinton, then LGBTQ. That will come from, so 2018, we have to accept this. Then we will get, because we didn't fully understand, because there's still beliefs that are tying us to worldly understanding and worldly understanding is apostate Protestantism with apus bull, we need more messages in the harvest time to burn off those ties, to give us a more understanding. If we look at the line of the Levites, we know that in that time period, we're also getting the studies of the Vespers. So I can put this up here. But it corresponds to the harvest time here. Again, more information on the same subject. And when... We, what we did in that last study is we went to, we said two streams, Uli, Hidekel, and we listed the players that we'd learnt about from uh, 2019 onwards. In particular, in this camp meeting that we're looking at, in the uh, October French camp meeting 2021, we learnt about liberal feminists and cultural feminists. Some other players that we've learnt about through Vespers are, I know I'm going to run out of board, but I will just show you, uh, New Atheism, Libertarians. And does anybody remember the other group that I brought up 
we didn't they haven't been brought up in meetings but there was another group talked about the baha eye i think it's baha -i. baha -i. okay so what did we notice was similar about all these groups that are on the wrong stream of information. What do they all have in common? Differences between men and women. Yes. Female essence. So that um, there is something intrinsically different in the nature between men and women. There are female traits. And some of these female traits are superior to male traits. Some of the, but the majority of her traits are inferior, but they are very different. So we won't go over all that, but uh, traditionally men are uh, assumed to be aggressive, competitive, dominating. Uh, women are to be carers, nurturers, empathetic, affectionate, emotional, that they are different. With the Baha'i, we learned that that yin and yang principle, which comes straight from spiritualism, is their idea of gender equality and that we have these female and male differences within us and gender equality can be achieved when we bring them into balance. And what do we... We totally reject this side. Over this side, we say radical feminism And the message is no, equality. There is no difference other than a few body parts. So this is radical feminism, uh, calls for a radical reordering of society. Male supremacy, patriarchy is to be eliminated because patriarchy, it's a system of oppression. It's found in all times and in all cultures. All societies and every period of history has had patriarchy. And so radical feminism is a call to totally deconstruct patriarchy and start again. No objectification of women. It challenges gender roles, the abolishment of patriarchy, uh, the elimination of sex distinction. And... Uh, Yes, so no male privilege. And in doing that, it actually liberates everybody. It's not just liberating for women, but it liberates men as well. So radical feminism, no difference. All these other uh, entities that we learnt about in our harvest times are about just refining our knowledge of feminism and gender equality. Because even till now, there are members that still think that there are differences. So, who have we left out here? We've got two groups. We've gone through... Uh, Elder Tess spent a lot of time on liberal, cultural, explain them. The Vespers have talked about the atheists and the libertarians. There's another group that we need to put down on this wrong stream. And that Men's group. Rights activists. Oh, yes. Yep. Sorry. Yeah, I'll put them here. So all of those, yes. Thank you, Sandy, that it were um, brought up in the Vespers. But there's another group that I'm thinking of. And Extreme left. Uh, yes, will there be libertarians? Any other thoughts? It's actually the subject of our the study we're going to review from Elder Tess. SDAs. 
What do SDAs think about women? They're very special. They're very important. We love our women. Look at Ruth. Look at Naomi. Look at Mary Magdalene. Look at Alhanna. Special women. Don't look at Beth Sheba. So we're, not, we're not so sure about her. Don't get me started. But women are special. They're unique. We, uh, we, um, we, we need them. But essentially, what are women? They are different. And it's because of their difference that we cannot put them into certain roles in the church. So SDAs belong on this wrong stream of information. It's the Laodicean attitude back here, this period of darkness where we think that there are differences between men and women. And God is going to take us through this process to instruct us in righteousness, how to treat each other, how to think about each other, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to take away our behavior, our dominating and submissive, depending on what you are, behavior towards each other. So SDAs belong on this stream. So before we look at the church's stance on LGBTQ, it's important to understand their stand on women. Just like Clinton comes before LGBT, when we look at the LGBT of the church, we understand that their idea of women leads up, is the foundational um, problem of why they can't come to terms with LGBT. It's there even though it's not stated uh, as such. So any thoughts before we go on? So radical feminism, we know that they are not different because we understand the nature of humanity that the nature of humanity is threefold, physical, intellectual, moral. When we truly grasp that, we can see no difference between male and female, no difference in their natures. Heart, mind and will belong to both sexes. Okay, so we're going to bring up... Ah, uh, so... The line of the Levites. When we're going through our harvest time, the Levites are going through their latter time period. And what we're looking at when we think of the mainstream church is where are they at as they are heading to shipwreck? As they're heading to Sunday law, what is preparing them for Sunday law? So we're going to go to a sermon in October of 2021 of the General Conference President. He's going to give a sermon and we need to recognise where that is in their history. This is leading them up to their, just prior to their, leading them in their closer probation period. So that for the Levites is what 2014 to 2019 was for us, we can keep that in mind. So I'm going to share screen and I want to take you to what the church was hearing in heading or in their uh, heading towards their close of probation and into their harvest time. This is called Trust God's Prophetic Word in the Coming Impending Conflict, a sermon given on October 21, 2021. And let's just read a few passages. Second Peter 1, 19 to 21. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and morning star rises in your hearts. 
Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So good passage, good place to start. We have no problem with that. We'll go to our next passage where he is going to quote Isaiah 8.20. So when I say he, who am I talking about? Ted Wilson, sorry. Ted Wilson will quote Isaiah 8.20 to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Accept and follow truth only according to this word, according to God's word, according to his word. Yes, we would agree with that too. And we would say, you need to take all the words. And you cannot pick and choose which words. If you're going to take all the words, be honest about it. When Paul says to the slaves, go back to your masters, then you have to accept slavery as well. So we have to be honest when we are talking about accepting all the word. Here, he says, this is what he's exhorting the members to do. Stay away from those who are proclaiming strange beliefs and aberrations of biblical truth. We have strong biblical foundational truths given us by God from the beginning of our Advent movement to, to be delivered to the world. Here we're going to see his first use of the word aberration. We're going to see he uses it quite a bit through this uh, sermon. An aberration is a departure from what is normal. A departure from what is normal. So we are to stay away from people that are proclaiming truths that are not normal, strange beliefs. Unfortunately, my fellow leaders, there are people who do not believe what we have just read. They seem to use the horribly self-centered, historical, critical or higher criticism approach, placing their own private interpretation on what the Bible says. Seventh-day Adventists believe in the historical biblical or historical grammatical approach, allowing the Bible to interpret itself line upon line, precept upon precept, verse upon verse. We believe in the historicist approach to prophecy, not the preterist or futurist approaches. The historical, biblical, hermeneutical method is the only method accepted by the Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay, so he says there are people that are teaching these aberrations because they are using the historical, critical, or higher criticism approach. Here, we would disagree in the sense that the, the, he's talking about methodology here. And the historical, critical approach is to go back in history and look at the context of the passage. Who's writing it? When are they writing it? Why are they writing it? We bring that knowledge also to the historical grammatical approach. We compare scripture with scripture. So we don't stay with one of these. We combine it in with the historical grammatical approach or the biblical historical biblical approach. There is nothing wrong with going back and looking at original context. What is wrong is, is, is if that is all that you do. And the example here is he's going to quote what? Isaiah 28. Line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. So here a little, there a little. Who is God going to teach knowledge? Who is he going to um, instruct? He's talking about methodology here. If we use the historical critical method, what are we going to do? We're going to go back and say, who's writing this? Hmm, Isaiah. When is he writing this? Oh, about, whoops, I should have looked that up, but 
some 100 years before Jesus was, was born. Why is he writing this? What are these lines he's talking about? Somebody like to share? What are these lines? When Isaiah says line upon line, is he History? talking about people? No. We, we talk about history. We say it's a line of history upon another line of history. That's not what Isaiah is talking about. In the historical critical method, going back and saying, what do these words mean in that context? What are these lines? Is it um, like God's law? Is it God's law like... Um... The the um like the um the plummet you know the um the line where you'd be measured by is it like that? So you you've got it halfway there, Catherine. The line where you would be measured by. What do you call that? The law, like a standard. I, I don't know if I'm going far enough. Probation, oh. probationary time. Measuring stick. <laughs> A measuring stick, measuring tape. Judgment. He's measuring his people. When he's saying line upon line, he's talking about a measuring tape. He is measuring his people. He is going to judge them. What's the rule of carpentry? Measure twice, cut once. Line upon line. We go line upon line, line upon line. Moses, Christ, Millerites, 144. We make an application, but if we go back into the, historically, Isaiah is warning the people that they're backslidden, they've drunken the wine, the, the leaders are drunk that the leaders are drunk and God's going to send the Babylonians. God is going to send the king of the north. That's the original context. Leadership have backslidden and are drunk. God's going to send judgment, but he's not going to do it before he measures them. And like you said, Catherine, there's the plumb bot. So the line is vertical, plumb. line is horizontal, plumb bob is Vertical. We, we make applications say, well, there's our line and our way marks. So when we go back and we look at the original, it helps us, gives us more in-depth understanding of when we make application. Because what is, if he was being honest, what's the issue then at the end of the world? Leadership are drunk. God's going to punish them by sending the king of the north. He's kind of shot himself in the foot there. So high criticism, it is a useful tool. It's just not the only tool. What Carpenter works with one tool. He says, we believe in the historicist approach to prophecy. Yep, so do we. We look back at history and that's what we've just done. The preter, not the preterist, which means everything's already happened and in the past, not the futurist, that everything still in the future hasn't happened yet. We don't believe in those. So, but we do believe uh, we can use the higher criticism. Can I ask a question at this point? Who do you think Ted Wilson thinks is the threat here? I don't suppose he's talking about our movement. So is he talking about a faction within Adventism or um, just uh, amongst Protestants in general? Uh, no, factions in Adventism. Yeah, okay, so uh, teachers in their colleges. Yeah, okay, I understand. Uh, uh, um, what's the institute called? The Biblical Research Institute. You, 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 everything's split. Everything's partisan. So, so, so is the church. 
So they have teachers in their schools trying to teach gender equality, trying to, to convince their students that women can be ordained. And you have others doing the opposite. You have pastors that the, the, they're, they're split on these subjects. So he's taking a conservative approach as a leader and he is, he's not talking about us. So, I, but he is talking about factions, yes. Thank you, Catherine. Good question. So he says, do not allow any other methods of biblical interpretation to be used in your churches, institutions or activities. Methods other than God's approved methods will only lead to absolute ruin and confusion and will be the foundation for easy acceptance of the mark of the beast, signifying the mixing of truth with error. So here he has connected the mark of the beast with wrong methodology. We would do the same. But we, we put a lot of emphasis on methodology, biblical interpretation. And uh, we, we disagree on, on that. We, we understand parable teaching, et cetera, et cetera. In this pastoral message, we will explore some of the faith-destroying theological aberrations floating around these days, absolutely connected with Babylon, confusion, and from the devil. And we will then focus on what our primary mission is, lifting up Christ, his righteousness, his three angels' messages, and his soon coming. So he's going to talk about faith-destroying theological aberrations that are absolutely connected with Babylon. Strong words. So we, he says we should expect these aberrations since it's the time of shaking as recorded in the late last day events. So they are to be expected. And what are some of these aberrations that so blatantly and grossly misrepresent God and his word? He's got a list of 14. So let's go to number one and we'll go down to here. The spirit of prophecy indicates we should read the Bible as it reads. Christ triumphant, page 226 says, the most learned men in the days of Christ, philosophers, legislators, priests in all their pride and superiority could not interpret God's character. The earth was languishing for a teacher sent from God. But when he came, just as the living oracle specified he would come, the priests and instructors of the people could not discern that he was their saviour, nor could they understand the manner of his coming. Unaccustomed to accept God's word exactly as it reads or to allow it to be its own interpreter, they read it in the light of their maxims and traditions. So long had they neglected to study and contemplate the Bible that its pages were to them a mystery. They turned with aversion from the truth of God to the traditions of men. Fellow leaders and members have complete trust in the Bible according to his word. Okay, so what has Ted Wilson done here and where's he gone wrong? Who'd like to share? Literal interpretation. And what way is it a literal interpretation, Brendan? Well, there's no spiritual application, but there's also, if you read it as it is, you're going to get caught <laughs> heaps of times. But he's basically so, saying what it yeah. says, that's how it is. <laughs> so we are under, to understand what happened literally then what do we do with that literal interpretation? You make an application to, to the present day, which is he's not doing. So first literal, then spiritual. So you must understand the literal. How is he not doing that here? What, what has he done wrong, Brendan? What's the literal? It's 
So you read the Bible as it reads. Or... Who were doing that, John? What was the question? Who's doing that? The most learned men. The <laughs> leaders, just like Isaiah 28. The most learned men in the days of Christ, the philosophers, legislated priests in all their pride and superiority could not interpret God's character. So if you're going to take the past and bring it into the present, what are you saying about the general conference in 2021? They're not going to understand God's character because they can't interpret it. Who aren't? The leaders. The leaders. Line upon line means you need to be honest when you bring the literal to the spiritual. He has not made the right application. This isn't about the laity. This is about the men in high positions, those that are leading out. So if he was to be truly honest here, this is him. He does not understand God's character. He is reading it in the light of their maxims and traditions. And what is their maxims and traditions? Patriarchy, gender inequality. He's turned from the truth of God to the traditions of men. So he has not, he's talked a lot about methodology. He, he hasn't put it into practice. He doesn't really, he can quote line upon line, but he doesn't know how to use it. And so in that sense, it's judging him. That line of Christ, bringing it down to the line of the 144,000, is judging him. And what is the principle? What is the key principle behind line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept, precept upon precept? What's the fundamental truth? Is it repeat and enlarge? In order to repeat and enlarge, what do you have to have? Two witnesses. Two witnesses. By the testimony of two, a thing is established. Line upon line, two. And then God will say, line upon line, two. And it's a matter of life and death. By the testimony of one witness, a man can't be put to death, but by the testimony of two, a thing is established. And then he can be put to death. We're talking about life and death here. You only get it right if you understand you've got two witnesses. He has no witness for the situation their church in is in, the, in at, at the moment. He, he can't. He has no historical precedent. Terry, um, also too, I, when, when you were reading that, I was just thinking there's always that um, compare, but never that they're, they're not contrasting either, are they? Not contrasting. Good point, Rachel. You want to expand on that? Um, I'm just thinking that it's. I guess it goes hand in hand with the literal and the spiritual. Like I think, um, yeah, just reading those bits that we've been reading, it just always shows that he's comparing, like you know, what happened in those eyes time, but he's not contrasting um, to where he's living at this point. Um, or maybe someone can explain it. <laughs> um, no, that's good. It's a really important point because sometimes we we do we compare a lot and we forget to contrast. So thank you, That's a, that is a really important point. Okay, so now we're gonna go down to, uh, uh, what? Um, I think it's number 12. Here we go, yes. Uh, Aber ab I don't know how to pronounce it. Aberrant. Aberrant lifestyle behavior versus biblical view of sexuality. So here's our aberration. Remember, an aberration is a departure from what is normal. And we'll read, talks about God making Adam and Eve. Didn't really want to read all of that. Um, we might read this one. We are to show Christian respect to all people, but God calls us through his strength to follow his created plan for human sexuality. 
According to scripture, individuals are created only male or female, and we are to adhere only to what the Bible says in lifestyle and practice. Adultery, fornication, and LGBTQIA plus are in direct opposition to God's law and heavily plan for human sexuality. We must make a conscious choice, even though unpopular, to speak up for Bible truth and not simply go along with societal trends. I encourage you to allow Bible-based groups like Coming Out Ministries to point people to the Bible and God's power to overcome sin according to his word. So what are the problems we've got here with this, uh, with this passage? So if we're going to compare and contrast, we go back to Adam and Eve, which he did in the first paragraph, which we haven't read for time. God created Adam and Eve, the first fa family, telling them in Genesis 1, whoops, sorry, Genesis 128, to do what? Oh. Be multiply. fruitful and multiply. Okay, so let's use a historical critical method. Let's go back. The beginning of the world, God creates Adam and Eve, two human beings. He says to them, what, 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 is this, what is the condition of the earth like in that time? It's empty. There's only Adam and Eve. So what do Adam and Eve have to do? Go forth and multiply. Build the world. Come down to 2022. What's the condition of the world today? What did we learn last night? Yeah, eight billion Four. people. There's eight billion people. We do not need to be fruitful and multiply. If somebody falls pregnant, has a baby, the, you know, there's a family planning children, that's okay. We support that, etc. cetera. Uh, not going to complain that uh, a child is born, but we don't direct people to go forth and multiply. The world's full. It's been done for a while. But when you read the word literally, what are you going to do with those verses? You have to bring them down to our time. If there's only Adam and Eve, then they can only do one thing, be fruitful and multiply. And when you put that on Eve, there's only one real role for her at the end of the world, and that's the role that she had at the beginning of the world. And so we know that God made the animals, etc. We know that he made a giraffe and he made an elephant and he made a cat and he made a dog. And yet we come down to our time and thousands of years of diversity and we see so much abundance of diversity in our world today. But we don't allow that diversity to Adam and Eve. We still want Adam and Eve being fruitful and multiplying in 2022. And anything outside of that is an aberration. It is a departure from what is normal. Now, what is the big mistake here that Elder Tess pointed out in this paragraph? What do these LGBTQIA plus have to overcome? Um, Elder Tess pointed out the um, uh, the asexual, I believe. Yes, she pointed the, out the I and the A. Yes, yeah, that's What's right. What's the yeah. I and the A, Lynn? Uh, well, the A is asexual, I believe, without any preference for sex. I was, um, I can't remember, intersex, both. So intersex is is what does can anybody explain intersex and asexual? I think I, if you're I born, oh, you, you go. Sorry, um, asexual is someone who has no desire, no sexual desire to go there. Um, whether you're male or female doesn't matter. Um, intersex is someone who is born with um, a, a various combination of sex organs. So it could be 
um, yeah, you could have male and female parts or you could have, um, yeah, um, yeah, basic, I'll keep it at that. <laughs> Thank you. And then he calls this what? According to his word. That would be sin. sin. That's sin. It's sin. It's sin. These people are an aberrant. They are aberrations. It is sinful. So somebody who has absolutely no sexual drive is sinful. Somebody that's born with differing organs is born sinful. That's Catholicism. That's Babylon. So he has shown his ignorance here, which, as Elder Tess said, we don't think there's any malicious here. But for somebody in a position like that, that is pure ignorance to be giving a sermon like this and to be uh, quoting the guidelines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church on this topic is very ignorant. So, um, just so a this thought, Terry. When, oh, sorry. Yes, Maria. Uh, um, just a thought to, uh, you know, he's giving that message to so many people and there would be people in the audience that would have those, those you know, they would, they would be those actual, um, those areas of that, that name. Imagine how they must feel to hear him speak like that in that ignorance. Yes. Yes. So our message, the first angel's message, calls us out for being sinners. So we really need to understand what sin is and what sin isn't. And that's the purposes of our message because we've been learning that from 9-11, to 2019, we have been given this message to understand what sin is. If we can understand that, we can also compare and contrast, understand the righteousness of God. So uh, what he doesn't do in any of this is he doesn't, what, what he, sorry, what he does do is he connects the sin and the, the act and the sinner together, which is, um, yeah, you, 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 uh, Elder Tess was clear in bringing this out that we're not saying, you know, uh, you know, cohabitation. We're not saying you can go out and, and have any uh, sexual behaviour. Uh, we're, we're still, just like we're Sabbath keepers, there are still laws of morality that we abide by, but there is nothing sinful in being born an L, a B, a G, a, a T, a, a, any, then there's nothing intrinsically sinful about that. That is Augustinian theology. That is um, rooted to a, original sin. Uh, this is Babylonian doctrine, not, not, except, uh, not what he's saying it is. So uh, we need to finish up. I just want to go to He's going to quote Revelation 14, 6, second angel's message. Uh, and I've lost my paragraph, sorry. Elder uh, Terry, you can still go for yes. another 15 minutes if you like. It's quarter past or a bit after, uh, it's up to you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm winding it down. But I'm you know, when you're in a hurry and then you can't find what you're looking for. So I'm, it's here somewhere. Oh, I'm sorry. <sighs> Maybe I haven't gone far enough. Here we go. I didn't go far enough. 
Okay, so he's read Revelation 14, 8. And he says, continuing in Revelation, uh, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This is the church down through the Middle Ages that continues today led by the papacy. It will, according to Bible prophecy, unite with apostate Protestantism and spiritualism to form the triumvirate attempting to force submission on all who faithfully follow the word of God. So now he, because all these doctrines that he's gone through, that we haven't touched them all, that the, the whole thing is uh, riddled with inconsistencies, but we, we touched number one and number 14. Now he's going to align those things up with the, the doctrines of Babylon. And he says that the church down through the Middle Ages is Babylon. It continues today led by the papacy. So the papacy is the is is Babylon. It will unite with Protestantism and spiritualism, but effectively the focus is on the Catholic Church. He's going to talk about the immortality of the soul and Sunday worship. And we'll just read this probably to close. Do not believe anyone who may tell you Sunday laws will not be enacted. That is an absolute falsehood. We read in Testimonies 4 that ministers who have preached the truth with all zeal and earnestness may apostatize and join the ranks of our enemies. But this does, but does this turn the truth of God into a lie? Nevertheless, says the apostle, the foundation of God standeth sure. The faith and feelings of men may change, but the truth of God never. The third angel's message is sounding. It is infallible. So he is quoting from Great Controversy and he does that up here in um, and uh, uh, I think we'll just leave that there, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it without finding it. So he's going to uh, emphasize that Sunday is the mark of the beast from the Great Controversy. So what does he get wrong here? based on what he's got wrong on other passages that we've looked at. He's if got we the use the Sunday historical... Sabbath. Yes. Sabbath. Why has he got the wrong Sunday law? What's he done? He's read it literally. Literal From to literal. where? Um, right, the right. Yeah, from the great controversy. So give me a date. 1888. So from the 1880, 18, uh, late 1800s to 1900, that whole time frame there, he's taken the issues that were around over 100 years ago and brought them down to our time. So he has not compared and contrasted. He, has, he, he refuses to use historical critical method and going back and looking at that history and then making a spiritual application for our time. So the same rules that we use for the Bible, we should also be using for the spirit of prophecy. So literal Sunday law in the 88 time period, literal Sunday law for us. So okay, so inconsistency. He, it's just inconsistent as well, because I'm sure he wouldn't have a problem riding a bicycle. Yes, thank you. So right through the this sermon, you'll pick up these inconsistencies where he puts such an effort on methodology. That's his opening statement. We're not using the right methodology. We're coming to wrong conclusions. That's why we have aberrations. He uses that word over and over again. And we say to him, you need to check your methodology because he's not being honest with his passages. He's not bringing them into our history um, properly. So LGBTQ, they are theological aberrations from Babylon. 
and Babylon is the papacy. So we, we are poles apart on this. So if we just close this up, everything that we experience is what they experience. They are receiving messages that are instructing them in righteousness and cleansing them from all unrighteousness. But Ted Wilson isn't giving that message. He's not instructing them in gender equality. In fact, he is just cementing patriarchy or unrighteousness. There is no cleansing. So there are, they are being challenged in this time period here. And now in their time of harvest, they would be receiving messages that are uh, really cutting them apart, that are, uh, that are separating, uh, that final separation within the church. We always thought that we would be ones harvesting but it's our messages that are harvesting. And I don't necessarily mean our YouTube presentations, but within their, within their church, they are listening to Ted Wilson and they are listening to others and they are working it out for themselves. Just like when you go to the United States, there's those that are listening to the Democrats, those that are listening to the Republicans. They're not hearing anything from us but the circumstances, the messages are there for them to make a decision. And we're seeing uh, partisanship in American politics. So we should expect there is a partisan lines being drawn within the Seventh-day Adventist church now. And part of that was the sermon given by Ted Wilson in October 2021. So we'll leave it at there for today and I, I will close in prayer and then maybe we could have some questions if you like for 10 minutes before Brendan starts. So if you could bow your heads. Our loving God in heaven, we praise you for your loving kindness and for your truth that we have the, um, the light of methodology. We know that it is there to keep us, to uh, to give us security in our understandings, to give us proof, to give us a sure foundation to stand on. And as we move forward, we know that more messages will come to give greater clarity to what we've already been given. Help us to see the, the not only just the truth of it, but how we arrive at those truths. So, we pray for the, our, the rest of our morning, for the message that is still to come. And we also pray for Elder Tess and Elder Parminda and the, um, help us to continue to review these important subjects that were our increase of knowledge and formalization in preparation for Sunday law. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.